All right, what is going on, everybody? We are back with another episode of Brass Tack Bodybuilding. I am here with Adam. You guys know Adam and Phil Viz, of course. Everybody was begging to get Phil back on nonstop after the last one. I convinced him to do so, so we are here now. What is going on, guys? What's going on? Uh, yeah, so today we're going to talk, talk about, we're basically we're mostly going to cover insensitivity resistance because a lot of people have been asking about that. I've talked about it a few times now, very briefly, like on TikTok and Instagram. And a lot of people seem very interested in it. They want to know more about it. So I guess the first the first way we should really open up with, with explaining this is explaining how insulin works and what importance that plays within bodybuilding, right? I mean, within reason, so that the listeners can actually understand it, of course. Okay, so how would you break that down? Okay, well... Insulin plays a lot of roles in the, in the body. We know that it elevates IGF. We know that it lowers SHBG. We know that it raises aldosterone. Um, those are all a little bit advanced topics. Aldosterone is for water retention. Uh, SHBG frees up more free test in the body, makes it more effective. Um, everybody knows raising IGF-1 obviously um, is good for muscle growth. Uh, but what insulin primarily does as far as the way most people understand it is it's a nutrient carrier delivery, whatever you want to call it. Um, it pushes nutrients into the cell. If you were to think of it as a delivery vehicle, um, your body would have a car versus insulin being more like a Mack truck, uh, depending on the dose though, you know, a low dose is not going to do that. Um, I see a lot of people, I see a lot of programs now where people are using lower doses of insulin uh, for specific meals and things like that. But what they have to understand is that two to three IUs is not going to do very much. Uh, and it's going to work very, very slow. Like even if I were to be sitting at, say, 110 with my blood glucose uh, and I took two IUs of uh, Humalog it would probably take me 20, 25 minutes to come back down under 95, you know, just a 15 point drop. So it's not going to be that effective. Um, effective in terms of what? But like, I mean, say that again? Effective in terms of what? In Effective in, in terms of shuttling nutrients. Um, if we want to have a profound effect, then we're going to need a decent dose. And I think a lot of people have shied away from the heavy insulin use because some coaches got blasted for abusing it. You know, some very famous coaches, they even make fun of each other uh, because of how much insulin is in the programs. So people being extremists, especially in this industry, they go the opposite way. So now they're trying to low dose insulin and do this and that. And don't get me wrong. I do like to utilize insulin on top of our natural insulin spice, kind of compound the effect and be able to utilize less. Um, because anytime we put something in our body like that, we don't have total control over it. So I'd rather your body do as much as it can and then enhance that effect. But typically, I've, like I've seen people post-workout, for example, do six IUs of, of, of insulin. And that's not going to do anything. You know, it's not going to do anything your body can't do. I've, I've done, done that it. before. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen yeah. very low doses in, in uh, protocols and they're just pointlessly there. They don't really do much. Uh, another one that I hate is Lantus simply because you could utilize Humalog, or Novolog, Theasp, uh, Apidra, all the fast acting insulin a lot more effectively than you could utilize Lantus. First off, if Lantus is in your system all day long, uh, you're going to have some type of... Uh, uh, desensitivity going on. So I want my insulin to get in, do its job and get out. I don't want it in my system all day long. Now you've seen, um, from some of the, uh, the chats that I've added you to the prep chats for my clients that sometimes Lantus can be used, you know, especially if somebody has insulin resistance, if somebody's older, you know, there's, there's certain places it can be used, but again, is silly low dose just to have a little bit of effect on what's already going on with the person. But as far as growing, there's this uh, bullshit going around, I honestly have to say, <laughs> um, where people think that Lantus is some super secret new thing that everybody uses to get big. And that's why the pros are big. And that's why I'm not. And this and that it's completely bullshit. It's not true. Um, well, from my understanding and 
I think you disagree with this. I don't know if Adam, if you have anything to touch on this, but I would constantly see open guys, specifically guys who are using a lot of GH utilize Lantis when they're pushing food very high in an off season to keep sensitivity high, but you don't agree with that method. I mean, like I said, there's situational uh, times when it can be used effectively, but again, in a situation like that, where you are using a lot of GH, you're experiencing the insulin resistance from the GH use, and you want to combat that. Um, I think, honestly, when people blast GH, they shouldn't be blasting food. Because that's going to lead to a lot of visceral fat accumulation, a lot of insulin resistance, well, a lot of body fat. How does, how does that GH work, though? Body. That's kind of like, isn't that kind of like contra, contradictory, I guess? If you're like an open body, but you have to push food. Like, you, there's no way around that, right? Yes, but you don't have to do everything at the same time, and you don't have to push food to the point where you'd be fat. You could you could push into a mild surplus and start to recomp and stay sensitive and make a difference. What happens is if you start to get really, really resistant on GH, then you're not going to get the return on it that you want. So again, if you're going to use high GH, you've got to know how to use it. You've got to understand it, uh, its effects on the thyroid. You've got to understand its effects on insulin resistance. Uh, you've got to understand its effects on water retention, ADH, uh, blood pressure increases that would lead to kidney stress, heart stress, all of these things that people just freely use these drugs and don't understand what exactly these drugs do, what they're meant to do, um, and what side effects we can have from them. So you know, people fuck these things up often. So as far as somebody who's using high GH, I think that there's other things that they need to be doing first uh, to fix that insulin resistance rather than just resorting to insulin. You understand what I mean? Especially pulling back on the food as well. I think that's a major driver of insulin sensitivity is being more sensitive to to the carbs. So uh, that goes along with what, you, what your point is, is pushing food and pushing GH at the same time, because we know that GH is going to increase blood glucose. Um, and if you're pushing the food and pushing food to an amount to where you're not able to store it all into the muscle, which has to do with the insulin sensitivity topic that we're talking about, um, you're going to accumulate more body fat and you're not going to make enough room in the muscle for the glucose. And eventually you're going to have the buildup of blood glucose, buildup of insulin, and then eventually become type two diabetic. I don't know if I, I don't I don't know if I agree with the the terminology of make enough room. What you mean is I guess mean what you I guess what you mean is make more permeable, make it more um make it better uptaking the carbohydrates, yeah. more sensitive yeah. essentially. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, is yeah. what we're looking at. Yeah. So, so um yeah, no, people fuck that up a lot. And I've said this on many podcasts, I've said this many times, I've said this on my social media that I have gotten people before who were eating a certain amount of food and were not growing. I cut their calories back, put food strategically where I felt it should be, restored their composition and sensitivity. And now they're growing and putting weight on eating less food than they originally were eating and mm -hmm. at favorable composition, you know? So if we get to the point where we're really, really insulin resistant, and we're eating a lot of calories, well, all those calories are going to the wrong place. If I had somebody who's eating bullshit number 3,500 calories, and their A1C is like a 5.3, which is not good. Um, and I took that same person and put them on the same diet and the same calories when their A1C is at like a 4.8, 4.9, which is good, they're going to respond drastically different. And because they're going to respond drastically different, they're going to have more favorable composition. They're going to have more muscle mass. More muscle mass is going to mean higher metabolic rate. Higher metabolic rate is going to mean that they have more nutrient turnover, better processing, they're partitioning the, the, the nutrients where we want them to go rather than where we don't want it to go. So we're basically shifting everything in our favor. Uh, one of the things that I've done with clients is if I have somebody who I'm ready to push GH on, I make sure they're very lean first before we start. You know, because I, I don't want to start, you know, behind the ball already. I want to be in a good position. I want to be ahead. So I always make sure they start very, very lean. And, you know, if we accumulate a little bit of body fat with uh, pushing the diet, that's fine. But if they're lean, they're going to be sensitive. They're going to have a favorable response. And in the past, what I did was um, I even talked about this on podcasts. It was mini diets a lot because you know you're pushing calories pushing food composition goes up and then you mini diet to reset but i've found that being more accurate as a coach probably last 
I would say five, six years. Um, you don't need to do that. You don't need to waste that four weeks on a mini diet. That's six weeks on a mini diet. If you can be a little bit more precise with the way that you program and make sure that you maintain their sensitivity. I've got guys in the off season right now that are registered mid off season, registering 4.9, 5.0, which you really won't find too often. I've got a lot of your viewers here. I bet you, you guys that are bulking and putting on some body fat, you go check your A1C, which now is over the counter. So you can go purchase it on Amazon and get an A1C test and do it anytime you feel like it. And you're going to see your 5'2", five, 5'3", five, some people even 5'4". Um, and that means that your body is not doing what you want it to be doing with the food that you're intaking. And you need to get that down. But so I know you say you want somebody to be lean in a general sense. Like, yeah, if you're holding more fat, you're going to be more resistance. But there's definitely there's we know there's guys who are lean and still have you know, that higher A1C number, they are more resistant. So how is that? How does that, how does that happen? If, if they're not type one? We just saw that with one of my pros, but he's uh 50 years old. So when you get to that age, you're going to start to have some type of insulin resistance. Uh, um, or, it's, you know, it's just, it's just an aging thing. It's a wear and tear thing. It doesn't mean it runs in the family. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that your body is not as good at, as it used to be at utilizing insulin and, and, and shuttling nutrients. So, would you so say, in that case, we did use it. Would you say that being lean isn't always an indicator that you are sensitive, but being fat always is an indicator that you're resistant? Fat is always an indicator that you're going to be resistant, typically. Now, fat, it, it depends on how fat. You know, are we talking obese? Are we talking about a little bit chubby? Are we talking about some love handles? We're talking about what, what, level of fat starts to cause insulin resistance like 50 and to 20 percent you know the guy that pushes the bulk too far yeah that that would be insulin resistant now guys that are lean that are insulin resistant are either abusing something or there's something medically going on wrong so that's what you need to you know pay attention to and see what you can fix and revise a lot of times coaches use like blanket methods like you said if somebody's insulin resistant they just throw in lantus well why are they insulin resistant can you fix it and if you fix it then you don't need to implement another drug to fix it you know and and this this happens all the time um doctors put people on blood pressure medication when the person just needs to drink more water you know uh, the person doesn't drink any water. They're eating a high sodium diet. You know, they're very retentive. Aldosterone levels through the roof. So blood pressure's up. And a lot of times you could just have them actually track their water. First of all, most people are surprised when they track their water. Um, I had somebody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I had somebody in, uh, I think it was November, uh, who had high blood pressure. And I asked him how much water he's drinking. Oh, I do a gallon and a half a day, really. I'm like, I'm like do, you, do you measure it? And they know oh, I, I don't keep track. So I had him keep track. He reported back. He's like, I'm doing about 80 ounces. I'm like, well, that's nowhere near a gallon and a half, <laughs> you know? Ah. So once we got his water intake up to a gallon and a half, and I tell people, you know, take eight or 10 water bottles, stick them on the counter somewhere in your house that annoys you and make sure they're gone by the time you go to bed. And there's your water intake. And as soon as he got his water intake up, blood pressure came down, dropped the blood pressure meds, didn't need them. Now here's a question because you know, this isn't as that. this isn't really relevant to the topic we're talking about. But since you're talking about water, because I've had, I'm sure Adam, you've had this too. Is I've had so many fucking guys. They always overestimate how much they drink. You know, I, I'm probably That's drinking it. three gallons a day, all that stuff. But then they'll say, you know, it's coming from diet soda. It's coming from this. Come from juice. It's not just water. Do you think that matters that it's not coming from just water, or it's just the amount of fluid total? You asked. Oh, I'm asking. I'm. I'll ask both of you. What do you think? Let's see. I'll reply after he does. I think it, it depends. So if you know you're having like a little like a little can of some sugar free soda, I'm not going to count that into my water intake. Um, if you're adding a little bit of like the flavor drops into your water, then that's still water. And yes, the molecule of water is still in those diet drinks, but I'm not going to consider that a part of my water intake, especially if you know you're not. Um, I guess not. I was going to say unless you're dieting for a show, but still, you're not going to be tracking that as part of your water intake. So no, I wouldn't consider diet drinks or juices um, as a part of my water intake. Well, see, I think that it matters what the source of uh, fluid does to your body. If it dehydrates you, if it makes things worse, if it my makes coffee. your body work harder. Uh, no, well, coffee actually has a diuretic effect. So um, I don't, think coffee is as bad as say diet drinks with tons of artificial sweetener or tons of sugar. Anything that um, 
kind of goes the other way with the effect that we're looking for, which is filtration assistance and hydration, then it's not going to be beneficial. If it's a ton of sugar and the sugar ratio is higher than the fluid, then we're going to have to be more retentive in that state. You know, if you're drinking a soda that's 12 ounces and it's got 50 grams of sugar, that's not going to work in your favor. That's going to work against you. Yeah, so that's a good point. If, you have, if you're drinking eight Diet Cokes a day, all that artificial sweetener, it's not going to be good. Your body has to filter that, you know, so it makes your kidneys work harder. So yeah. it's, it's not going to be as good for hydrating. So like he said, if you're adding some Mio drops or, or something like that to your water for flavor, I think that's absolutely fine. I think if you're overdoing the artificial sweeteners or you're overdoing the drinks that are loaded with sugar uh, or you're overdoing energy drinks, they're going to work against you, not in your favor. So I like to see at least a full gallon of real water. And then if you want to get the rest of your fluids from something else, as long as it's not terrible, I'm okay with that. Uh, a lot of people uh, will count the water in their intra workout, but your intra workout's got 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates. So is that really helping you as much as you think it is obviously it's fluid it's going to hydrate to some extent but it's not going to have the same effect as drinking pure water so um well you can literally feel instances, that's something i feel like you could literally you could fucking feel it like there's times where i'll drink my initial workout and it's like i don't even want to drink anymore because i feel dehydrated and i'll drink water and the water just enough, feels, right yeah it feels significantly better just to drink the water i feel like i'm actually getting hydrated so you could tell you can literally tell well, you have to understand that when you're intaking sugar, you're spiking insulin. When you're spiking insulin, aldosterone levels go up. When aldosterone levels go up, you're more water retentive. Um, and that's going to translate to, um, you know, subcutaneous fluid. It's going to blood pressure. It's going to have a lot of effects that we, we don't necessarily want. Um, and we combat this by having a high water intake through the day. That's why it's important. Um, uh, I think we had this conversation, I think this week that when we're trying to correct people's blood pressure, for example, a lot of times the doctor will tell them lower your sodium intake. Yeah. And I think that's terrible because if you start lowering your sodium intake, you're going to elevate your aldosterone levels. When you elevate your aldosterone levels, you're going to be more water retentive. Um, the proper way to do it is to track exactly how much sodium you're having do that every day and then increase your water to sodium ratio. So if you were eating four or five grams of salt a day, right, which is what competitive bodybuilders uh, and classic competitors and physique competitors and just uh, in general will do men, um, then you need to be drinking about a gallon and a half of water. If you're yeah. drinking a gallon of water and you're taking in five grams of salt, well, you're, 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 you're not adequately um, filtering and hydrating your body. So you're going to run into all kinds of problems, also facilitating motility of food and digestion as well. So all of these things uh, come into play. But if people want to fix their blood pressure, don't change your salt intake, raise your water intake relative to where the salt is. And that's always going to lower your blood pressure. If it doesn't fix it at that point, then you start looking at other mechanisms and that's not the problem. But very often that is the problem. Yeah. So another thing also that I've actually seen on TikTok is... Mm -hmm people tracking their water intake through diet sodas. And I think one, that's why, that's why I brought it up. Yeah. Cause you see yeah. people always say that shit. Our like it doesn't matter. Model of it. And I think one other reason why they should not be tracking that for their water intake instead of regular water is because of those artificial sweeteners that are in there, which is going to negatively affect their digestion. And that, that has more downstream effects uh, on their abs absorption of nutrients. Um, of course, you, know, you don't want digestion to be, uh, to be off. So um, I think that's another reason why they shouldn't be drinking a bunch of diet sodas um in replacement thought, the artificial sweetener thing is a whole whole other thing i don't do we have like significant research that actually like backs that because it's it's so controversial Please. and i feel like obviously like it is truly like, you could literally feel you could see it in different people like obviously they respond worse to it they have you know that the result is there they don't respond they it fucks with their digestion but do we have the actual research that backs that because it's so controversial and everybody says it's okay and then we have the other side that here's the thing we have we yeah we have research that says both sides but i have an experience here that i can share um that was pretty distinct um and i actually tried to replicate it to see if it would have the same effect uh later down the road and it did so i think it was 2000 might have been 2014 2015 i'm not i'm trying to forget the year but 
Um, I began my water load and I was using a lot of crystal light because I hate the taste of regular water. I don't mm. like the taste of water. So I like I like to have it sweet. And I used to have a real, real sweet tooth. They died down at an older age, but um, I was loading my gallons with crystal light and I had to make weight and the scale was going up and up and up and up. And I ended up retaining about eight pounds of water. Mind you, I had drank three gallons for a couple of days loaded with artificial sweetener loaded. Yeah. And it started making me really, really water retentive. And it started affecting my digestion It affected my sensitivity. My muscles were flat. I was weak. I was tired. I felt like dog shit, but luckily I realized that's what I did switch to pure water. Um, and luckily I had started because, you know, I do with my clients. I start my water loads far out. I started increasing water weeks out. Mm -hmm. So, by the time I got into that final week, I had corrected the problem. And then I wanted to see in 2019 if I could replicate this. So started it two weeks out, did two and a half gallons a day. Um, I was using Mio this time. I used a ton of Mio and right back up. Water retentive, scale going up, muscles flat, no energy, no strength, feeling like shit. Mind you, this is a ton of artificial sweetener. Not, not what you're going to see in the studies, probably quadruple what you'll see in the studies. Um, but it just shows that at some point it affects you, you know, so we want So we want to know at what point is that or how much can we, you know, get away with? Because if a heavy dose of it is going to drastically affect me, then a light dose of it is going to affect me some, somewhat, but just not to any significant extent. So yeah. I like to try to avoid that. Um, I know almost yeah, all coaches will pull artificial sweeteners towards the end of a prep. Because they've probably seen similar things. Mm. Um, most of, like I said, we the research, the jury is out. We haven't done enough research on it. But the people that have real world experience with these things across the board agree that it's going to start to make you, make you be water retentive. It's going to affect digestion. It's going to affect everything. So you want, you could have artificial sweeteners. It's not going to kill you, but try to minimize it. Mm -hmm. you drink a lot of artificial sweeteners adam it's actually a funny story um from i don't know when the super bowl was i think it was like february or something yeah uh, i i had a zevia if you know what that is it's, it's a it's a diet soda flavored with stevia and i was like this is really good and because i've had it a long time so i just started having it as a part of my diet just one a day then i moved it twice a day my digestion was fine and so I was like i think this is totally fine for me it's making it easier to get my meals down because i'm in a bulking phase and it was just becoming more of like a daily routine to just have this with these specific one and two meals. And then honestly, like about a week ago, I started having some bad digestion and I was trying to figure out why, because my diet is very clean. I'm not eating cheap meals. And I thought it was because maybe of a lack of fiber because I'm not eating enough vegetables. And so I threw in some bell peppers, still was having some uh, digestive problems. And then I thought maybe it's the Zevias. So I took out the Zevias literally the next day, perfect digestion. And I was like, okay. That's it happens. It happened. It happens fast if you flush it, yeah. you know, but you know, we, we see these things as coaches across the board. This is why we tend to be ahead of the science curve because we're in, you're the constantly field. doing experiments. That's literally what the job is. Exactly. It's exactly what the job is. And it's funny when people, Oh, uh, what's your source on this site? Your source, you know, show me research. Well, research isn't usually available on things until, you know, it's you've, been done more, you've done what you've done. 10 times more research than what the fucking PubMed study says. Like you've done that a thousand times. Now, here, here's, here's the thing, though. It, it's on an individual basis. Do you trust that individual's analysis is the question. You know, a lot of times I see people that are doing things and they think things work a certain way, but their analysis is not the best. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you have to also trust the person's ability to isolate variables, observe the situation, recognize what's going on and have the proper analysis and diagnosis of certain situations. You know, so I've, I've personally shown many, many times that I've been ahead of the curve. Um, you know, and even John Meadows said, I'm glad that I didn't wait until science proved things to try them and see that they work. People forget this research doesn't just come out of left field. It, yeah. it, it's based on theories. You know, things that people have seen work and said, let's see if this actually is why this works. But it's not just you're not just pulling it out of thin air. It's being based off of something that somebody already previously had an idea about. And a lot of times the research is not 
you know, it's not perfect. Um, I don't even think that certain research projects in these fields are, are done very well at all, you know, because they're not, they, they, there's no. so many things that they miss. Like a lot of them are very about, flawed. Yeah. When we were talking about muscle activation research, well, some people can fire off their muscles harder than others. We know some people train harder than others. Um, and then we've seen that even with specific individuals, if we can prime your body and, and make you activate to a higher degree, you're automatically going to be stronger. This is why like I, when I, train with people. I lift with people. They always used to say to me, like, um, you know, I'm in, yeah, for the pressure, I'm intimidated. I'm stronger because I'm here working out with you. And my answer is no, you're not stronger because you're under pressure. You're stronger because we took the time to potentiate properly and activate everything properly and bring out your true potential. So, you know, even something like that, you know, going through a proper potentiation protocol is going to change the reading on it. Was waking up so, your, your nervous system. Exactly. So, yeah. You know, there, there, there's a huge flaw right there. First of all, if, if I take you, me, uh, you know, a kid at the gym or, you know, and then we take somebody who's, you know, grows very easily, might be a big guy, but doesn't train very hard. And we start comparing, you know, you can't go off of that no. because there's going to be too much variance. When but you yet, look at that's what they're basing a lot of this research off. No. Yeah. When you look at, I mean, if you really just have, I don't know if it's just critical thinking skills or common sense or just knowing like the bare minimum. But when you look at like all this research, like, like I'll look at these studies and immediately like, it's just disregarded. Cause like there's so many variables that aren't accounted for that the whole study just becomes meaningless. Like you can't say this produces this result. So this is the best, you know, this is the best thing or whatever, whatever we're talking about. And then it doesn't account for how much sleep all these individuals had, the genetic variance between them, you know, how hard did they train? You know, what was that individual's diet like? How often was their their meals, you know, spaced apart, their nutrient time? Like there's so much shit that goes into this that it's almost impossible to like really give an it. You just need to under, understand how it works. You just need to understand how it works in the body. If you if you take, for example, you know, uh like me, for example, I have a very fast metabolism. You know, you get 10 people like me and you feed us all McDonald's and we still have abs. Oh, well, McDonald's keeps you lean, you mm -hmm. know, or we take somebody like Phil Heath when he just got out of college and we give him 20 pound dumbbells and tell him to curl every day and his biceps start growing. Oh, well, 20 pound dumbbell curls, grow your biceps. You, you know, take you somebody who trains like Phil Heath, say, you know, to take Phil Heath's workout and then take fucking branch Warren and it's two completely different styles of training, but Phil is fucking growing Growing like this, doing fucking higher volume, you know, not to fail or whatever. Like, is a, does that produce the better result now on paper? Is that, you know, what the research shows? Because, you know what I mean? They can prove anything with People a study. Can. Like, if they want to be able to prove something, they can with a study and make it look official. But if you actually know how to look at the studies, then you can see the flaws in them. But that's the main flaw in these bodybuilding studies is, first of all, there's not really any studies on actual bodybuilders. And yeah. they can't do any actual studies on the drugs. Populations. Yeah, with drugs, especially like enhanced bodybuilders. So it's just impossible to have a, an effective study on competitive bodybuilders because there's not enough of them to actually have a large enough sample size and also to actually have the compliance of the bodybuilders themselves. Or even if you're just talking about uh, like fitness lifestyle athletes to have their compliance that they're actually sticking to their diet 100%, they're training hard and also, you know, even- uh, What is their stress life and their their stress life in yeah, their daily life? Like life cortisol, also, like- like yeah, there's so many things can affect everything. What their perception of failure really is. That's why I hate like the, the RIR uh, style mentality is because yeah, there might be studies to prove it and it might work better for some people. But if you're trying to preach that to everybody, that everybody should be training with reps and reserve just because of studies, that's where I think, you know, people are going to be holding themselves back because they don't know what their, what failure actually is. And their perception of failure is going to be different. People in the studies, their perception is going to be Then they're afraid to go too hard. Yeah, I think that I think that people need to be more clear with research when they say, you know, reps and reserve can cause muscle growth. Um, the reason why certain times reps and reserve can still cause muscle growth is because you're still getting a lot about it, a lot out of the set before you get to failure. And, you know, we saw like Phil Heath would rarely go to failure, but he recently did an interview. And he said, well, I, I didn't have to. I was able to get more out of my sets than most people can. And I even explain this to clients. Like if you look comfortable on your first six reps of a 12 rep set, then those first six reps were useless. You know, you're, you're, you're not doing anything. You've got to challenge yourself more. 
A lot of people don't challenge themselves enough, but the reps and reserve is based on being able to get more out of the set before those failure set, before those failure reps. The reason why people have to go to failure is because they're exhausting all their motor units. So the auxiliary ones are kicking on and you're getting all of your motor units involved. However, if you could get them all involved from rep one, uh, you know, due to uh, either natural ability or skill um, or practice, then it's going to be effective. You know, I when my legs were were at their biggest, actually the um, the video that I posted the other day about squatting, um, when my legs were at their biggest, my legs were measuring thirty two inches, thirty two inches lean, and I was not doing anything to failure. I was getting close, but I wasn't doing anything to failure. Because what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to do more sets at a higher performance rate than if I had exhausted my nervous system by going to failure on the first set. But that's only because I'm really, really good now. Well, that's the other thing. With, that's the other thing with not going to failure is that within those studies, they're also doing more volume. So you could get the same result by not going to failure, but still... Like Adam's saying, like, I just think that's a horrible thing to go on the internet and preach about. Like, don't go to failure save reps. Like, I think it's a horrible mentality to instill in people who are new to the gym. Mm -hmm. You should reps and reserve, reps and reserve are not going to work um unless you can activate your muscles to a very high degree to begin with. That's first off. Second off, I think that heavy compounds are uh smarter to go reps and reserve simply because of form breakdown and risk of injury and a shift of where the bias and emphasis is on the movement. You know, we see a lot of people when their quads get tired squatting, what do they do? They start shooting their hips, sticking their ass out yeah. because they're trying to use their posterior chain. The set's over because yeah. you can't perform the set the way you've been doing it anymore. Um, and not only that, heavy compounds force more effort. They force it. And this was my argument with barbell rows. Oh, well, our barbell rows aren't braced. They're not an optimal movement. Well, I would argue they teach you to train harder. Mm -hmm. And and that's always going to translate. People don't force understand. you to train harder. People don't think about that. So they only think about there's this becomes such a huge thing where everybody always thinks about what is the best on paper for hypertrophy. And it's like the answer is obviously fucking simple, right? If you take out every other muscle groups assisting, like, yeah, you're gonna fucking have the most tension on your lats if we put a chest support there. But it's like, where are you at in your lifting development? Is this gonna teach you how to bring more intensity to the table? How do you need just more overall mass? Like there's oh, it's more than just what is the best movement for this specific thing, you know, that's not always the answer for every individual. That's like more so somebody who's more advanced. It's like, I really need to bring up my lats. Okay, like, let's do this then. You know, another thing that plays into like the barbell row versus like a single arm lap pull down uh, conversation is the amount of intensity required, but also the fact that it's such a more challenging and demanding movement that because it demands more, you're going to put in more effort. You're going to require more adrenaline and because of that increased adrenaline you're gonna have more motor unit recruitment and therefore you're going to be able to train harder and get more out of the muscle itself versus something that's easier it's not going to require as much adrenaline and so your perception of failure might be okay that was kind of hard versus if you know this is life or death and this is a scary movement if you're doing a barbell squat versus you know a lunge or a quad extension it's a little bit scarier you're, you're going to have more of that um intensity just because of it being a heavier barbell scarier movement now i think that the, the the big problem nowadays is that there's so much knowledge now and there's so much education that people are trying to find ways to make this easier is what i think it boils down to we yeah. see this with a lot of uh, a lot of pro bodybuilders we see this with a lot of national level bodybuilders um I made the mistake many years ago of talking about, for example, using Adderall in the last four weeks of your contest prep in order to slightly mitigate hunger and slightly counteract the complete loss of energy um, and, and, and really try to keep you more active and allow you to train harder and, and allow the, the cravings and the diet to not get to you. But I didn't specify that I was microdosing it. So what did the entire industry do is they started taking full 30 milligram. At, oh, I can do, I have one client save me one day. Oh, I could stay on the stepper all day. And he was peeled. I'm like, the fuck? I'm like, so, so I told him to take the Adderall and I told him, I specifically told him what? five milligrams. He's like, no, I was like, I, I, I'm prescribed it. I was just taking thirties. I'm like, okay, so you're high. You know, and, and a lot of pros Mate. now and a lot of <laughs> national competitors, there's insulin, there's, there's, there's Olympians that I know of right now that smoke weed before cardio, that'll do cocaine before cardio, 
One of them does ecstasy before cardio, microdosing. Some of them do mushrooms. But everybody is trying to figure out how to make this process easier. What can I do to kill my appetite? What can I make to do to make this process not so torturous and not so hard? And I think that it's translating to the training. They think that if they train super perfect, then they don't have to do the really hard shit and put themselves you know, in those types of physical stressful situations. Because let's be honest, they don't, nobody's going to enjoy it. I always yeah. say like people, people would say to me, oh, I love leg day. You don't train legs if you love leg day. Yeah, I would, I would be training by myself, giving myself anxiety on leg day. Because I'm like, this is going to fucking suck. And if you're like gung-ho, super happy to train legs and you enjoy the workout, you're not fucking training legs. You should feel like shit. Would you train legs if you want? I just get to excited to destroy, my, destroy myself. So that's why I enjoy it. Just because I want to <laughs> not be able to walk. You don't enjoy the actual workout. No, no, no but I fucking... enjoy being able to just exert everything out of me. Nobody likes being in extreme pain, feeling no. fucking dizzy, feeling nauseous. No, Nobody terrible. likes that. No, I hate feeling you like know? I'm about to puke after a set. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. We're getting off track. We got to go back to insulin <laughs> resistance. Okay. So... We never even talked about what insulin resistance versus sensitivity. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? You know, resistance is your less resistance to insulin. It's in resistance the body. to the effects of insulin. It's resistance to the effects of insulin to bring nutrients into the muscles in order to nourish them and power them and, you know, generate energy, everything that they do. So if you can't deliver nutrients, then you can't perform. You can't recover, um, you know, and you can't advance. People think that it only relates to carbohydrates, but it also relates to amino acids and it also relates to fat. And this is why you don't want to eat high fat when you take insulin because it will be stored. Um, excess carbohydrates also will be stored. So you've got to be careful where and how you use it. A lot of coaches um, believe that you need to rotate insulin use, you know, three months on, a couple months off. And I don't believe in that. I okay, believe well, you can leave it in year round if you're precise enough with it. Insulin can be used to improve uh, insulin resistance and sensitivity if used correctly. The problem okay. is most people don't know how to use it. They read some bodybuilding primer that somebody wrote on a forum 20 years ago. Or it's just bro science passed down from person to person. And they're following these stupid protocols without having any understanding whatsoever of its actual medical application and how it works in the body and what it does and how it affects the body. Um, so it's just a lot of misuse. And, you know, okay, how many well, times have we seen people? What do you say? Yeah. Well, how many times do you see somebody get really, really fat, you know, bulking? It used to happen more so in the past than it does now because we have a little bit more knowledge and experience. But, you know, you can find pictures of Sean Ray, Jake Cutler, Dorian Yates holding 20 something pounds of water. Yeah. Probably well, people use 20 percent body fat. People use that as an argument, but also at the same time, it's like, I'm sure you obviously know this is like, that's not really even a good argument too. Cause those guys were just like top fucking elite genetics. So really like they could have done a lot of shit and still got fucking huge. Like, was that no, really limiting that? What, them what, that I'm, much? Saying, what yeah. I'm saying is you see, you see the effects of misuse is mm -hmm. what I mean. You know, they got away with it because of their genetics and because of their work ethic and the, the, the other drug intake, you know, they're elite bodybuilders. Most people aren't going to get away with doing what they did to get to that point. Yeah. You know, if you start getting somebody that fat and holding that much water, they're going to have a ton of health complications and, you know, they're going to have a ton of insulin resistance. You know, what people don't realize is a lot of the elite genetics they have elite response with everything, not just to steroids. They have elite uh, insulin sensitivity. They have elite health. There's yeah. guys that I've seen come back with good blood work, blasting a gram of trend, you know, like some people just had super genetic health too. And people don't take that into account ever. They don't ever yeah. consider the person just, they're, they're, you know, their the kidney filters better, you know, their, their insulin sensitivity is better. Um, I remember telling you uh, about, Luke Carroll, when uh, I had in and out for his final meal, literally in his program every day, and his A1C came back at like a 4.8, you know, he's, he just has super sensitivity and there's nothing that I've ever been able to do to get him over a five. Okay. I want to lead, I want to lead into that. Um, okay. First of all, let's take out all the guys that are using insulin. Cause I want to have this for people who are like are fucking natural or maybe they're not at that level where they're pushing insulin. Maybe they're like newer, you know, newer to gear or whatever. 
Um, what exactly would you advise someone to avoid doing to avoid, you know, getting resistant, staying sensitive? You know, what is the typical course of action for that? Well, I actually have something that's a, like a simple way to look at it. I'm sure Phil's going to be able to make it seem a lot more uh, knowledgeable from what I'm saying. So the, the basics of maintaining insulin sensitivity and losing ins insulin sensitivity has to do with overfeeding in food. You're going to become less sensitive to food. Think about it, not even with food, with anything, with drugs, with training, with anything that you can have a tolerance to. So if you increase the stimulus, you're going to eventually increase your tolerance and become less sensitive to whatever that stimulus is, food, training, drugs. So you want to maintain somewhat of a lower tolerance in order to maintain your sensitivity and see a response from that stimulus. Now, when it comes to food and insulin, and we're talking about food going through your digestive tract into your small intestine, into your bloodstream and into the muscle, if you start overfeeding a bunch of food, there's only so many carbs, blood glucose, that your muscle can absorb from the bloodstream. And once you reach that threshold, you're going to store it as body fat. And so over time, it's a process of keeping that muscle glycogen full and still overfeeding. And that's what causes you to reduce that sensitivity because you're not bringing that stimulus down so that you can maintain that insulin sensitivity, that sensitive to glucose as well. And therefore you're going to continue to put on more body fat. And now you have two problems. You have one that now you have more body fat and that's going to have effects on the muscle because of lots of different pathways. Um, which I'm still learning about in my actual college classes. And the other aspect is you can't get as flat when you're fat and full, like full bulk, bulk mode versus if you're completely shredded, you can get more depleted when you're shredded. So because you can't get as depleted, you're not going to see as much of a super compensation effect. That's the reason why people, when they're shredded, they can eat a cheat meal and store a bunch of it or even all of it into the muscle because the lower, the, the more depleted the muscle can get, the more of a super compensation effect, as well as just the more room. And I mentioned this earlier, the more room you have to store more glucose as glycogen. So now that you can't get as depleted and you have less signaling for uh, uh, insulin sensitivity, so storing more glucose in the muscle, now it's just going to make it harder to build muscle because you're going to be less responsive to food, amino acids as well. Um, I'm going to stop right there because I can keep going, but uh, <laughs> No, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I think what you're specifically was where, what you were referring to is insulin sensitivity with the supercompensation effect. You know, yeah. you're going to be able to uptake more, the more sensitive you are. And I think that a lot of people drastically overestimate the amount of food that you need to grow because one of the popular sayings, one of the things I've hated the most in this industry, um, granted it is right sometimes, but it's often not right too, is that if you're not growing, you're not eating enough. You've got to eat more. That's not necessarily true. You might not be doing the right things with the food that you're eating. Um, Scott Stevenson actually sent me something, uh, I think it was a, about a month or two ago, um, that showed um, you know muscular improvements in a caloric deficit. Uh, so what would that tell you? What people really forget often is that we have a calorie medium, something that can supply energy at all times, our body fat. So technically, we're always in a surplus if we could utilize that body fat for energy, and then utilize the food that we're eating for repair and muscle growth, right? So I'll, we, people forget that often is that we've got plenty of body fat in the off season and that can act as a calorie medium. So, you know, what do we see that gives us some evidence of this, right? Now, a lot of people that are viewing this will probably have gone into contest prep at some point. And if you've done it correctly and you had a good coach, you probably saw at like four or five weeks into the diet, you started getting great pumps. You started breaking PRs. You started getting stronger. How the fuck am I getting stronger? Because yeah, you feel I, just, I just by like dieting that, that like that like twelve to like eight week mark, you feel fucking great. It's twelve to eight weeks out. You're eat, you're eat, you're eating like you're not full. You're not starving. You're getting great pumps, performance. You, that whole phase right there is just like I, I just felt great. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody you you should be able to grow until eight weeks out. You should be able to make improvements and grow because you're recompositioning at that point. You're not truly in a deficit because you've got plenty of body fat. 
So as long as you're eating properly and everything is efficient, and now that you've dieted, you've gotten rid of some, some of the body fat, you've improved your insulin sensitivity, and that's why you start growing at that point in a calorie deficit. So you don't always need to be in an intake surplus when you have plenty of body fat to grow muscle. I think what drives it more is how hard you train. And, yeah. and how well you recover, how much you rest, how low you can keep your stress. You know, I've said this many times, you keep bringing up stress that for men, stress can really slow down results for women. It completely halts it. Like I've, yeah. I've literally seen numerous times, you know, um, a client will be dealing with something and having a hard time. And all of a sudden they're in a better environment, in a better state. And they start growing like Ben Hodge, for example, uh, I posted him uh, recently. He went from I think like 227 to 257 in like a six month period. And one of the reasons is, is he just changed his environment. He moved. Uh, he met somebody that he's really happy with. He's got friends there, training partners, support, good job. And, you know, we didn't change a whole lot. The only thing that changed was his head. And all of a sudden results start coming. And sometimes that's what you need. Um, I, I have this with my clients all the time. Um, every time I intake somebody new, I make sure I get videos out of them to see how they're training. And, and like clockwork, they don't train hard enough. And I tell them, you're stronger than this. You can train. And then eventually when I convince them that they can train harder than that, and they learn how to train harder and use heavier weights, all of a sudden the growth rate accelerates mm -hmm. uh, because of the effort. So I think that if you're training hard enough and you're keeping stress down, and you know, you're keeping digestion healthy and you're keeping sensitivity high, you don't have to eat nearly as much as you think you do. Um, I was um, looking through Instagram yesterday and yeah. I sent a picture, um, again, I sent it to Luke because we like, Luke's very, very smart. So we like to go back and forth on things. And I said, what do you see wrong with this picture? And it was a bodybuilder who had been, begun dieting for a pro show. And it was clear that he still had visceral fat. And that was from how big and puffy he got in the off season. I could see it. He's struggling to get that stomach in. And what happens now is you've got to burn up that visceral fat too, to get peeled. You know, it's going to be hard and it's, it's going to affect your, your insulin sensitivity. It's going to affect your response it's going to affect a lot of things. So how fat this guy got in the off season and how much water he was holding and how big his stomach got because of all the visceral fat. Now he's got to go back the other direction and, and, and diet that off too in prep. So his body fat's probably a lot higher than what it looks like on the outside. Yeah. Okay. So back to the maintaining sensitivity aspect of it. I know what you like to do and what every coach I've ever worked with does. I know you do pretty much zero carbs, but it's not really zero carbs because we do have like that bigger meal at the end. So it's not like a whole zero carb day. I know why you do that. I don't know if you want to explain it, but a lot of coaches will just do lower carb days, right? And when I've talked about this before, what people get really confused about is, do I need to increase the proteins and fats for that day? Because now I'm going to be in a deficit for that day. And we, like we just discussed, you don't need to be in necessarily like in the surplus or even in a surplus every single day of the week. But I just want to go over that again so people could nail it through their fucking head and understand why exactly they don't need to be in that surplus every day. Well, I, I, like I said, I like to avoid the mini diet situation that I used to go by. And this is one of the ways to do it. Um, when you are on a recovery day, an off day, what's essential for muscle growth? Protein. Amino acids and fats. Yeah. And that's carbohydrates. They're not essential. Um, so they're just excess calories on those days that are not exactly needed. I would rather go higher on the protein and the fat and give the body the essentials of what it needs to grow and keep those carbohydrates down. Now, keep in mind, it's not just the carbohydrate restriction that's going to improve sensitivity. It's the total calories coming down. That's going to improve. So, yeah, so you're not, cause you just said, you just said bring proteins and fats higher, but you're not bringing them high enough to compensate for that total caloric loss. No, absolutely yeah. not. No. Absolutely not. I, I might add another ounce of meat, two ounces tops. I might add another 15, 20, 30 grams of fat on the day, but that's it. You yeah. know, it's, it's certainly not going to compensate for four or 500 grams of carbohydrates. It's still going to be a lower total caloric intake. Yeah. Um, and I, th I feel that from pulling from carbohydrates and still keeping the protein and fats there, which are essential, um, you know, we maintain uh, composition, sensitivity, and we just have an overall better response. And it's more linear than having to take one step back, two steps forward with the mini diet approach. You know, you might put on 
you might, oh my God, I put on 30 pounds, but my body fat went up 6% and I've got to diet that off now, you know? So now not only do you have to go back in the other direction and start dieting that off, but you're losing that four to six weeks that you could have been growing. Yeah. Well, I mean, even with that approach, maybe not necessarily the way you do, because I know you, you go a lot lower. A lot of guys don't go that low on the off days. They'll just, they'll drop it somewhat, but um, there still is a point for some people where they, they still, they still might need to, even with that approach, enter a fat loss phase at some point, if they're just indefinitely growing, or maybe they just need to alter the diet at that point too, uh, to be even lower. Cause like you said, people will eat more than they think that they, uh, people think they need more than they actually do when it comes to eating. If they get too fat, then yeah, I think once you reach a certain point where body fat gets too high, then yeah, you will either have to do a mini cut or do a full full cut. Um, uh, my dog's doing something. Uh, I think that's definitely a really good approach is having that carb cycling uh, phase. Hold on one second. Well, I like the way that you do it because – like I said, other guys will do like a lower carb base, which makes sense. You know, yeah, I, there's, I don't think there's really an issue with that, but the way that you explain doing like the no carbs and then having that bigger meal at the end, because you are going to, I guess, kind of relaying back to what Adam was saying about like the super compensation thing, right? You know, like you are going to be more sensitive from being in that lower state all day. And, you know, now you go out and you have, you know, a burger from Texas Roadhouse and you're just going to uptake those nutrients much better than you would as opposed to if you just had, you know, just carbs throughout the day, right? Well, this is why I like to do the cheat meal on the off days rather than the training days. Um, you asked me this once, why not put it in as the last meal on my training day instead of my off days and help me grow more? And my answer is because you've already been in a surplus all day long. You're not at a shortage of calories, mm -hmm. you know, so more is not better because if more was better, we got guys that would eat two pounds of protein a meal. You know, they yeah. would eat two pounds of steak every meal. You know, there's guys that would do it. I heard, I heard Kai Green actually did used to do it. So, you know, there's extremists that will, you know, take it to the limit. If I agree, was eating eight pounds, eight pounds uh, a day. Was he? That's what they said. I, I remember I watched a documentary about him when I was like 14. And I've watched it numerous times, but he says, Dave Palumbo says he's eating eight pounds a day right now. Funny. I remember um, when I, uh, when I trained Rami for a couple of days up in, in Connecticut, he told me a story of when he spent some time with Kai. He said he spent a day with him or two days. And he, you know, it was funny because back then he didn't speak very good English, but the way he described it to me, like I completely understood. He said, Kai, every meal, all day, all day. I don't know how. He said, <laughs> he eats steak like this, like big, like steak. He said, and his stomach come out like this and he take the waist and he's like, oh, like he's basically describing how, Kai used to put his waist trainer on to hold his stomach in after every meal. And he was eating gigantic portions of meat. And I said to him, was that like two, two portions larger than what you would eat? He said, no more. So it was, he said it was more than double what he would eat in a meal is what Kai was doing every meal all day to grow. And I believe it because Kai was just that dedicated. He was willing to do anything. You know, I told you a story. I can't really repeat online that I heard about Jay Cutler. Um, it's just crazy the way that people will just find a way to succeed, no matter how hard the situation really is. But those are the people that are champions. Those are the people that win, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a limit to how much your body can process. So if we're already in a surplus on training days, then I don't see it necessary to go crazy on that final meal versus on the off day. First of all, you have, you have to consider the psychological aspects of it too. A yeah. lot of people don't have the toughness to do zero carbs. Yeah. A lot of people don't like to do that. Um, I actually had a consult call with a, a pro level coach this week. Who's uh, he actually uh, coaches an Olympian. Um, and, and we had the conversation um, about, uh, sorry, I just lost my fucking train of thought. What were we on? You said you had a consultation call with uh I was, trying, I was I was thinking about not mentioning the person's name and I lost my train of thought we were talking about. We were talking about uh insulin carb days. Days. people don't yeah. people don't want to do zero carb days. And the okay. <laughs> actually I just completely lost my so train anyway, of thought. I have this actually is... a counter argument. I have a counter argument or at least just like a question for doing that for I don't know if you do that for everybody who's in a bulking phase. So I have we actually me and Seb have a friend who has a very fast metabolism and is very lean, very insulin sensitive. And he gets very flat no matter if he eats, you know, 
six, seven thousand calories in a day has you know, he's like Gabe, like Gabe. He's literally like Gabe. He will wake up flat the next morning, no matter how much he eats. So for somebody like that, do you think that they should really be pulling their carbs down on their rest days, or should they still be trying to keep their glycogen levels as full as possible, even though he's just not going to put on body fat? Um, it's very hard for him to put on body fat. So I also I also um, think realistically. He, he does misses. not, he does not eat enough consistently. So it's He'll like go we through can... phases. So like I've lived with him and he, he goes through phases where he will eat enough consistently for days on days, but you're right. No, like some days he'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the situation regarding Gabe, for example, Gabe's got glutes year round. And whenever I run his A1C, it's always four, seven, four, eight. So because he's able to do that, I keep the carbohydrates higher and his carbs are actually are in on his off days. I very rarely do that, but, but they're still always going to be, what is it? They're still lower compared to the higher day, the training They're day. lower than the training days, but they're still reasonably high. I could probably look it up for you right now. I would estimate it's probably 400 grams on his off days. Yeah. So there's always going to be exceptions to every rule. It's, but it's going to be situational. Yeah. So you have to kind of check those situations and see what's going on. If, somebody's you know not growing and their sensitivity is low then that i mean their sensitivity is good meaning their a1c is low and that means they're going to need more food in order to grow it means they're burning through it so it all depends on how the person handles and processes these things um, a lot of people feel they need carbohydrates on off days and they really don't you know it's because they want them because they enjoy them because they get the serotonin spikes from eating carbohydrates well you adam you, adam stepped out so you also missed like we don't do um it's not just zero carbs all day i mean maybe he does for like prep and stuff but like in the off season it's like the first four meals will be zero carb and then the last meal will be a big cheat meal or like a cleaner meal which is higher carbs that way like like you said mentioned before like the super compensation thing so you're going through this whole day where your bg is really low then you have a big meal like a five guys burger you're going to intake more of those nutrients it gives you a psychological break you're able to enjoy yourself on the end of that off day, you know, you're going to be fueled okay. for the next day. And then also, I think it would, I, you, if you want to touch on this, it helps with your appetite too. When you're pushing food every day in an off season, you have that break for that day. So when I have my days where I'm like doing those, those low carbs, so those first four meals, I'm not really like, I'm not hungry really at all. Like, and then yeah. the next, it just helps keep the metabolism gotcha. going. So um, just for all the listeners here, it's hard for me to hold a thought while other people are talking. That's why I interrupt people a lot. Because if I don't spit that thought out, sometimes I lose it. But you I remember told me what not I was going to do say that. about this topic <laughs> coach that I, was, that I was talking about before. Um, and it's a psychological approach to dieting people. If people don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, they're more likely to crack. Um, but if you give somebody a light at the end of the tunnel, a reward at the end, and they know that it's coming, they're more likely to stick to it. So this coach wasn't planning any cheat meals or refeeds or anything like that out ahead for clients. You know, he would just give them as he feels like. I'm saying, so I explained to him, you're going to make a lot more of your clients cheat this way because there's no end in sight. They're thinking I might never get a cheat meal. They're well, that's starving. also very, de that's dependent on the person. Cause there's definitely people, I'm sure you obviously have people where it's like, there's no reason to give this person a cheat meal like at all. Like, like they, they, they don't need it. Oh, but listen, if, if, if there's not a light at the end of the tunnel, they're less likely to do it. So back to my yeah. point about the off days with the low carbs, if somebody's more likely to go zero carbs on their first four or five meals, if they know they're going to get a cheat meal at the end of the day, you know, if you've got two consecutive off days and there's no cheat meals in sight and you're off season, you're not even dieting. You're thinking, what the fuck is a little extra food going to hurt? You know, you know, I'm not dieting. I'm not getting ready for a show. So I'll slip this and I'll slip that in because, you know, they see no end in sight. If you put cheat meals into the program in the off season that they know they're going to get, they're less likely to cheat. One reason why, um, I'm regarded as a really good coach and people have seen that I get results across the board. And I'm one of the few coaches where people will talk about how I treat my regular people, my regular clients, just as good as I do my pros, as far as with the approach and with everything else. And that comes down to, you know, really, um, being attentive and making sure that these people are doing the right things and understanding where they're coming from. So getting, making the programs possible to do. You know, some, you can't throw, a, you know, a six meal a day plan at somebody say, here, just go do this, fit it into your day. 
You know, what if they train fasted first thing in the morning? You know, what if they have only one meal before bedtime? What if their schedule changes from 11 a.m. training to 4 p.m. training and it moves all around? Well, yeah. You know? So you get people in all of those situations where you throw like a generalized diet at them. Not going to be able to do it. So making a program doable and executable is going to ensure more compliance. And yeah. when you get more compliance, you get more results. So a lot of the reason that people will see that my clients get results across the board is because I make sure it's doable for everyone. You know, it's not necessarily a matter of I'm smarter or my guys work harder. It's just it's more doable. It's more executable consistently yeah. well back to and what you were you don't saying make programs that way you're not going to get results yeah well, back back to what you were saying about you know you're know, making programs like that understanding everybody's coming from a different place i want people to also understand because you obviously know this as well as adam is a lot of people will be stuck in their ways so somebody might come to you people come to me and say hey i trade fasted or you know i have to train before work and if like, that's the only time you could do it, yes, we'll make it work. But it's like, like you asked me, like, I like to train after meal one and you said, can we do two meals? Cause that's better. So it's like, if you can go after work and we could get more food in you, I'm going to ask you to do that. Cause we're going to, I can assure you that you're going to have better, better workouts, overall, better progress. But if you have to do it this way, we can make it work this way. You know, do you have to train at home in your garage or can you go to a gym? You know, why coach should always adjust the variables in those situations, yeah. you know, uh, you, people, people, people will throw like a, a six meal diet at someone and say, I don't care which meal you train after the fuck do you mean? You don't care which meal they train after. Yeah, I know. You know, you need to have specific macronutrients in place at certain periods of time in the day. You know, I'm not going to have somebody who's got, you know, a, a medium metabolism who trains after one meal, eating a hundred grams of carbs in meal five, you know, yeah. what the fuck is the point of that? Yeah. You know, right. so it, 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 how, but, but if they were training after meal five, yes, I would have a hundred grams of carbs in that meal. So you can't just throw a generalized meal plan at somebody and say, fit this in, it's going to work. No, because nutrient timing and macronutrient breakdown plays a big part. It matters. And anybody who thinks it doesn't try backloading your carbs and training early, see how good your workouts are. <laughs> Probably not going to be anywhere near as good as having a sufficient amount of carbohydrates pre-workout. Um, and listen, we know that this is pretty simple. It's just, it goes back to customizing the programs, making sure it fits their day, making sure that it's doable so that they can execute. You're going to get more compliance when it's more doable, period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's always first priority. So back to the, something, how do we, how would you have advise somebody to go about obviously besides just body composition, seeing whether or not they're sensitive, obviously HP one, AC test, right? If you're above 5.3, we want to focus on improving that. Um, but is there any other indicators you, you should really look out for other than just getting that test? Right. Yeah. Really. If somebody said, deficiency. somebody said, you know, doing blood glucose, but I know that's not going to really be a good measurement to see whether or not you're sensitive. That's that's obsolete now. We used yeah. to re we used to ch we used to check fasted blood glucose, and we used to check check blood glucose between meals to see how sensitive somebody is and to see how they're handling food. Not because it's really it's 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 not really realistic to ask somebody to go to the doctor every month to get an A one C test, you know, mm -hmm. and see where their sensitivity is. But we know an A one C test is not a snapshot. It's not where your blood glucose is right now. It's an average. So we know where your blood glucose was sitting based on A one C. So now that the A one C is present, checking blood glucose as a means of trying to see how sensitive somebody is, is is completely obsolete. So I would always look at the A one C first. I would look at their digestion. I would check their stress because stress can affect digestion too. And I look at the A1C. I look at their digestive efficiency. Now, why and do you say are they trained? Why do you say 5.3? Because on a scale, anything up to 5.7 is what's considered normal. So where does why do you say once you get to 5.3, you're gonna be in a bad You gotta remember the higher the the higher the number gets, the more the the the, the less effective insulin is going to be. So we want to keep it as low as possible. Listen, can you grow at 5.3, 5.4? Absolutely you can, but yes. you're not gonna grow as well as you would at 4.9, 4.8. You know, something like that. You're just not going to respond to the food the same. We see when people come out of shows, for example, people are probably registering a four, 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 five, something like that, like completely peeled. And they're so sensitive. 
give them 300 grams of carbs a day when their off season was six and they're going to be fuller and make gains because they're so sensitive. The more sensitive you are, the more of the, the, the higher the percentage of the food that you're eating goes where we want it. So basically I say it's, it goes further. Um, so if I were to have a 3,500 calorie diet and that person's registering a 5.3, if I had that same person registering a 4.9, those calories would go further. They'd grow better. So mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, just, paying attention to where their sensitivity is, is going to determine how well what you're eating actually works. So at so that point, if you, at that point, if somebody's at like a 5.3, what is the typical course of action to improve that? Just lowering like off day food, lowering the whole diet, going into a fat loss phase or increasing energy expenditure. If you're up to a 5.3, 5.4, you probably need a big correction. So at that point, I really try to walk it back. Usually my first mode of action is to remove the cheat meals. So I'll tell them, pull your cheat meals for two weeks, repeat meal five uh, for meal six on off days. And, and that usually will do the trick, but I'll usually do that if they're like a 5.2, something like that. And I only need to walk it back like 0.1 or 0.2. If I have to walk it back like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, then I got to diet them, you know? Mm -hmm. And how often do you suggest people get their A1C tested? Well, listen, now it's, it's, it's over the counter. A box of four of them, I think costs 65 bucks. So it's less than $20 a test. Why can't you run it monthly? You know, I, that's the way I see it. I ask for it pretty often with my guys um, in the off season after a period. Usually, I, like if I have them register to 4.9 and I know their body really well and I know the program is accurate and the calories are where they should be, I probably won't ask again for three, four, five months, you know. But if we hit a wall, if we hit a stall, you know, the pumps start fading strengths not moving then we've got to check and see what's going on that's usually the first thing that i'm going to look at you know and i'll and you know what people will find is and this is for the coaches that are listening here you have to come to the acceptance that more than half of your clients are cheating on their diet and you don't know it and they're not going to tell you and they will swear to the death they will never admit it no matter what you say no matter what you try they will lie on top of a lie on top of a lie they will not tell you so don't assume that you're going to pull this out of people. If somebody comes, some people, some people will come to you and say, I slipped up. I did this and that. Those are the honest people, but you're never going to have somebody who didn't tell you that's going to go, Oh, you know what? Fine. I'll admit it. I did. Like you're not going to break people down. You're just not, they're going to drop you as a coach because they're uncomfortable with you before you break them down into that. So you've got to keep an eye out for those things and, and keep in mind that this does happen. And that's why, like I said, I give the cheat meals on the off days because they have something to look forward to. If you're eating rice, crispy treats post pre-workout and you're eating cereal post-workout and you have a cheat meal on your off days and you need to cheat on my diet maybe this isn't for you you know it's already it's it's already very easy i literally let you pick whatever cereal you want every day and you get rice crispy treats pre-workout and then you get a cheat meal on off days what do you need you're cheating every day what 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 do you need to cheat more for if you okay. can't adhere to that this probably isn't for you you're not it was literally it was literally too much for me it's like, I need to eat something cleaner. I felt like shit from cereal. I was like, we'll just go back to cream of rice. I, I actually, I give cereal post-workout to people because it's enjoyable, but I prefer clean food. I would yeah. much rather see somebody go with a lean cut of meat, a couple cups of white rice and some pineapple to facilitate digestion and elevate those carbs a little bit more. You know, I would rather a clean meal. It's just people have a hard time eating five, six clean, big meals every single day. So the cereal... Is, is kind of like a break. You know, you're drinking a whey shake, you're eating cereal, it's very easy. Sugar expands the stomach, so it doesn't feel like you're as full. You can eat more of it. You can, you know, you can eat less volume and get more calories in with it. Um, however, people have to keep in mind that sugar is not the best thing for your digestive tract, mm -hmm. uh, especially processed sugar. So um, you want to minimize it the best you can. And, you know, in Sebastian's case, listen, we, 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 we pull no punches about the fact that we're, we're looking to compete Olympia level. So, we want to have his career extended long time. This is his job. This is his money. This is his passion. And, you know, he's going to do big things with this. So we need to protect his digestion as much as we can. I don't want to get him to the Olympia stage. And then the next year we're having digestive problems. It's like, oh shit. Now we got to deal with this. You yeah. know, I would like to not have problems with his digestion until he's 35. You know, everybody's going to get it at some point because we beat the hell out of our digestive tract. It's wear and tear, but yeah. you can minimize the damage and, 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 and make it a lot. Well, that's further. another thing that this people is do is 
going back to the whole, you know, insulin sensitivity thing is the guys who eat more than they think they have to is they're fucking their digestion up. They're fucking with their gut health. When they're, you know, I, we all, I'm sure you've done this. I've done this. You know, I used to make myself throw up every day before high school and I would force food down. I'd be like, I have to get it down. I would throw up literally every morning trying to eat two cups of dry oatmeal. It was fucking disgusting. And I feel a lot of kids like, you know, just like force food, force food. Cause that's like the old school thing. You know, it's like, obviously you're going to be, you're going to be uncomfortable to an extent, you know, it's not always going to be like super easy, but there's a point where, you know, you're doing too much. You're doing more harm than good. And, and this, and this is all about response by the body, getting the body to accept food. Um, I don't, a lot of people, you have a lot of young listeners, so they might not remember this, but the experiments that I did with blood glucose and the way the body accepts food and what I did with James Hollingshead when, uh, he was, you know, pretty much in the last call outs in every pro show that he had done. And then as soon as we linked up, he never missed first call out again. And I don't think he's missed first call out in a very long time because maybe there won't be a sense, um, with his other coaches. Uh, but um, one of the things we did was we ended up competing six weeks from off season because the only thing that I changed is I had him microdosing Humalog to get his blood glucose into range before each meal. And his body was processing each meal more efficiently because of it. And his glutes started coming and they were in it in the, his glutes came in complete off season. And we were just like, what the fuck? He's like, you think we can compete in six weeks and just do this one? And I was like, yeah, probably, you know, we had aimed for a later show. So, uh, we were, we, we didn't even start dieting yet. So we're like, all right, fuck it. Let's just do it. And he ended up placing third, you know, and, okay. and did really well. You know, he only lost to two top 10 Olympians. So I think that there is something to say about making sure that the response is proper too. Yeah. And that's just yeah. acclimating the food also, you know, just like training, you know, people don't think to see it like that. People don't understand that when you're trying to grow, food is already going to be hard. It's already going to be difficult to eat. And if you start overeating more and making yourself more uncomfortable, that's going to stress the body out. Yeah. Pain and suffering are signals that our body sends us that says something is wrong. We don't like this. Fix this. Stop doing this. You know, that's why our body makes us feel bad. That's why we feel pain. Something's wrong. Don't do yeah. this. Stop doing that. And when you're constantly nauseous and sluggish and you know sweating, sitting there watching TV, that's a sign that your body is not in a good state. It used to be a very popular thing. People laugh about the sweat stains in bodybuilders' armpits at, at, at shows, you know, wearing like a suit or a dress shirt and their armpits are sweating, they're, they're dripping sweat. And, and people thought this was like they were making jokes about it, like it was funny. No, your your health is terrible. You know, that's not a good thing that you're sweating, sitting there in a seat, watching a bodybuilding show with the air conditioning on. It's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, I remember we had a pro come to an expo when I worked at Gaspari Nutrition and his wife sat there holding a fan on, <laughs> you know, that that's, that's not good. Well, that guy's also dead now. <laughs> wow. uh, not funny. I'm sorry. I didn't mean like that, but like it, it, crazy. it's yeah. not a good thing, you know, and, and people don't understand it. So like, People used to say to me like, uh, oh, I love your metabolism. Like, you wouldn't love my metabolism if you were a competitive bodybuilder because you don't understand how much I've already had to eat to get big in the first place. I was nauseous after every meal for 10 years. You know, that's well, how do fun. people rather starve. find how much they need to eat? Because we know it's not always necessarily like you want to be in a surplus, but surplus for is going to be different. It's not always about the scale going up. Right. So would you say the scale? How much does the scale matter to an extent? How do you find how much you need? Because I remember when I was younger, like when men's physique start, start, started out, you know, you had all those guys talking about shit and a lot of them would say this is the dumbest shit ever. They all promoted training seven days a week. I remember they used to say you need to eat at least 3,600 calories if you want to grow. Like that's the bare minimum. And obviously that's not fucking true. Like there's guys who could grow literally on like 2,900 calories. So how do you find that spot? Because guys will do like the calculator on the calorie maintenance calculator and those don't really fucking mean anything. So how do you go about finding that if you don't know where to start? Remember, that, relating to my story, what I used to do as far as how many calories I used to eat, it was because I didn't know enough. And there wasn't any good educators like you guys. You guys are so blessed today because there was hundreds of questions I had that nobody had the answers to. Absolutely no one. No one could even guess the answers to. So I always said to myself, you know what? I'm going to be this resource someday so this doesn't happen to someone else. So that at least I'll have answers for these questions and these situations, which is why I tried to figure out everything. But the amount of calories that I was eating, probably I would say up to seven, even sometimes 8,000 calories a day for many years was overkill. Because like you said, I was stressing on my digestive tract. I, you know, it was making me sluggish. It was affecting my training. Um, and the fact that I can't get fat um 
kind of made me think that it was okay because I'm not getting fat. So this, the food should be fine, but that's not how it works. And I wasn't really growing great. And I didn't really start to really grow. I would say until 2015, when I got more accurate with my food. And then in 2016, I think that I was only around 4,500 calories at my absolute biggest, you know, just with more precision, less total calories, a lot less total calories, but more precision. And I was at my biggest, you know, so that tells me that what I had been doing previously was just overkill. And still people do that. Now there's a lot of overkill granted there's exceptions to every rule. Some people got to get big and chubby to push new boundaries and break plateaus and make new gains. But that's not often the case. Often the case is going to be people are going to grow leaner within reason. I don't mean peeled, but I mean leaner. If we look at all of the best natural bodybuilders in the world, because we know they don't have the PEDs to help them. So if we look at all the best natural bodybuilders in the world, what are they all do off season. They stay lean because getting fat will not work for them. They won't gain shit. They'll just look like hell. They all understand they've got to stay lean to make gains. And why should that be any different for somebody who's PED enhanced? Maybe the PEDs help um, control composition a little bit better and they drive muscle growth better. So you kind of get away with things that wouldn't normally work or that work for you in when certain situations they wouldn't. Um, but staying lean and, and having better insulin sensitivity with a lower A1C is almost always, I should say, probably always going to lead to better results no matter what. I think one thing to add to what we were talking about a little bit before was uh, Seb asked, how, how do people know if they're losing insulin sensitivity besides, you know, piercing their skin and getting blood drawn? I think one of the main, uh, obvious factors to look for would be how are your pumps in the gym and how is your strength in the gym, your performance? So if you're not able to get a good pump in the gym, and if you're, if it's taking you a long time to get a pump in the gym, you're probably not very insulin sensitive. Um, another thing to look for is if you increase your carbs and that's not helping you get a pump, you're not getting fuller, you're probably too fat and you're not, uh, you're, and you're also full in glycogen also, that's also what that means. But, um, those are the main things that I would look for is how are your pumps in the gym? How's your performance in the gym? And also what happens when you increase your calories? Um, and that's what I would look for first. And if, if those are telling you that, okay, maybe I'm not very, as insulin, sens insulin sensitive as I want to be definitely, you know, get your blood drawn, see what your uh, uh, A1C looks like, but also pull back, pull back on the carbs, maybe push the cardio up. Also look at your training. You know, there's all this variability that goes into everybody, but uh, maybe you're just not training hard enough and causing enough, you know, glycogen depletion and uh, insulin sensitivity through just exercise itself. So maybe you need to do train harder throughout each set or maybe do more sets. Um, but that's, I think, one thing that the listeners should definitely know and look for and understand how insulin sensitivity actually plays a role into, uh, uh, you know, their, their training and, and their performance and all that. No, that's uh, that's phenomenal insight. And that's exactly what I look for. I have that in my, in my check-in forms, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how are your strengths? How's your pumps and, mm -hmm. and where's your appetite? Because if your insulin sensitivity goes bad, your appetite's going to be affected. That's you know, uh, a lot of times when people can't eat, it's because your A1C is high because your sensitivity sucks. Your body's not asking for nutrients. It's saying, I already got plenty. Hunger is your body saying, I want food. So if you've got plenty, your body's not going to ask for more. So yes, pumps, strength, appetite, those are all warning signs that your sensitivity is not where you want it. And like you said, yes, you need to do something proactively to, to deal with it. I've seen um, situations, and again, this is for the coaches watching, and maybe some people who have seen had this happen to themselves, um, that if somebody has an active job, like construction workers that tend to get laid off seasonally, your construction workers, your electricians, all, all of your people that, that get that laid off seasonally, you'll see when their neat goes down, their non exercise, their non exercise activity thermogenesis, the amount of calories you burn on a regular basis throughout the day with normal activities, meaning your job, walking around, showering kids, everything like that. Um, so when their activity levels come down because they're in a layoff period, I've got to adjust their diets because they're going to get fat. Their sensitivity is going to be shit. And what I had them currently eating, um, you know, in other situations, you know, it's got to be, it's, 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 it, everything has got to be handled as its own situation. I have one guy 
we were stuck at about 215 pounds. He runs a jackhammer all day. And he's got these giant arms, which makes me want to go buy a jackhammer. <laughs> I don't know what I would tear up, but um, he was very, very lean. And we were stuck like 215-ish. And then what happened was he got to a layoff period. And what I said to him was, we're not going to change your diet because – that was already holding you. So now you should, it should be like, you're going to be in a surplus. And he shot up into 230, gained 15 pounds. Most of it was muscle in, I think it was like a three or four month period, you know, because the, 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 the previous situation was just too much activity and, and it was too hard to get in enough food and digest and process it to get him growing when He's in the summer heat jackhammering, you know, some jobs are just not conducive to bodybuilding. They're going to hurt you. Um, I have certain, I have clients that will work long shifts, for example, people who work 12 hours, something like that, but they only work three days a week. So I have them training on the days that they're not working because I'm not going to, you're never going to leave a 12 hour shift and have an amazing workout. It's not happening. You know, right. or you're going to, what are you going to try to do? You're going to try to wake up super early, get no sleep and then run a 12 hour shift, trying to get your meals in running around activity. You're not going to recover well. Right. You know? And I think also so, stress plays a role in that also. And, you know, people who have more stressful lives, they can't recover from as much of a training stimulus. And so, for example, like I'm in school right now, I have a full time college schedule. And so I've noticed in my own progress that I can't. Uh, I'm making good progress, but I feel like I made better progress when I wasn't in school because my stress levels were lower. I was in, my appetite was also better because stress also affects my appetite. And so I know that I'm going to be making a lot more progress when I'm done with school because school is not conducive for bodybuilding. Just like you said, some jobs are just not conducive for bodybuilding. Um, so I'm just looking forward to be done with so that. I don't think that it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible to make progress with a heavy no. schedule, but I think it hurts you. Yeah. Um, I believe Branch Warren turned pro as a with his own personal training business that started at like 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. and went worked through the fucking worked through the day 18 hours plus got his bodybuilding in. But that's the, that's the extreme. That's somebody who just refuses to fail at anything in life. And you could see he, he succeeds no matter what he does at everything because right. he's going to go a thousand percent no matter what he does. But right. for most people, like you said, having too much on your plate is going to hurt you. I have people that have had children and when the baby was just born, I'm like, all right, we're going to pull back. We're going to cruise now. No, 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 I can do it. No, because first of all, you're going to be waking up in the middle of the night sometimes to check on the baby. And it's like, if you're letting your wife do it hundred percent of the time, you're an asshole, <laughs> you know? So trust me, a newborn is going to be more than you can handle right now. So we're going to take this as a cruise period. And once the baby's three months old, six months old, something like that. I'm fucking blast. And we can start to... thinking about pushing again, <laughs> but you're not going to grow with a newborn. You're just, unless your wife is Superman or, or you can afford a nanny or her mother's always there. Your mother's there always helping out. Like if she's doing it by herself, you're not making gains, you know? So like you said, in certain situations, like I have, uh, I have one kid in medical school right now, uh, two kids in medical school, and we're not really looking at shows and, and, and to push crazy progress. One of them we are because he's just that dedicated, but the other one we're not simply because it's just not doable. When, when you got finals coming and you're in medical school, it's, it's a 24 people have done right. medical. People have been in medical school or know people that have been in medical school it kicks your ass. It, it it takes everything you've got and more. And you still feel like you don't have enough hours in the day. And you think you're going to make progress as a bodybuilder? Right. No, you're not. So, um, you know, th there's there's been so many situations um, that I've had. Uh, I had a, a client when I was a personal trainer back in the city, and I understood this, who ran Verizon's marketing campaigns. So you can imagine how much money she made. But she told me, she's like, for 90 days, they own me. Like, she's like, I... I, I can barely get up to take a piss. She's like, I have to do this in 90 days or they're going to find somebody who can. She's like, so they, they like, there's like, it's, it's impossible for me to do anything else. And she's like, I guess I could come here on two hours sleep for 45 minutes. I'm like, you know what? Terrible idea. You know, just, it's not going to be conducive. You need that sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. So people need to really look at their schedules as far as stress mitigation to decide when they can push and when they can't. I think that also kind of relates to something is people ask what the best training split is. And, you know, best training split for somebody who has 
you know, who works online for a couple hours a week versus somebody who has a 40 hour a week physical labor job, they're not gonna be able to train as many days as someone who has less stress in their life. So I think that's just one thing that people need to take into consideration with the training split. I'm not going to train somebody high volume who's working a manual labor job. You yeah. know, they're already using their muscles and everything so much. And people don't take into account CNS stress. Yeah. Now, this is why we don't do cardio on leg days. Why? Because you're not going to be as strong. You're not going to perform as well. Now, uh, don't take oh, this right. as a... We need context for that though, because if some yes, if that, some, if there's, that. there's some fat fucking guy, he's doing cardio on leg days. No, I'm gonna. I'm, I, I was gonna get to that. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think that cardio in the off season is a bad thing, and it, no, it's oh. not. Fasted cardio is actually a good thing if you keep it low intensity. You know, it has to be fast because you're not stressing out the nervous system. You want to you want to minimize nervous system stress and just get a little bit of calories burned. Yes, I get that you can burn 200 more calories in that 40 minutes if you go a little harder. I don't care about the total calorie count. I care about not affecting your training and just getting a little bit more calories burned. It's going to help if you do it fast. It's going to help you eat better, prime your day better for for meals and digest better, and in turn you're going to perform better. So uh, a little bit of seated bike first thing in the morning is going to be better for everyone as long as you're not grinding it out. You know, I'm not going to put somebody on the stepper. I'm not going to tell somebody to do high intensity interval training. That's going to affect their performance later on. I'm talking about just getting a little bit extra out each day. Well, I, have, I have pretty much all my, almost all my guys do fasted cardio throughout an off season. All just for, for the sole fact of, you know, burning that little extra bit of calories better. Um, you know, it would help with body composition, doing it fast specifically. Um, also appetite when you're pushing food, that's probably the, I think that's the biggest thing is really the appetite for the guys that, you know, have a hard time eating. Yeah. For, for all, for all of your listeners, this doesn't mean that if you're only sleeping six hours a night to get up an hour earlier now and start doing cardio and only get five sleep takes priority. Fasted cardio is for people that schedules allow that fasted cardio to fit comfortably in prep. We have to do it. There's no choice. Off season, I only put that fasted cardio in if their schedule allows it. I'm never going to allow. Even some people are like gung ho. They they're like, oh, you know what? I'll sleep five hours. I don't care. And my answer is always the same. No, I, I, that's not what I want. I want the extra hour of sleep. You know, it's, also, it's not going to be. Confusing. Also, with that, just comes the individual having a scheduled lifestyle. Because I have like you. Obviously, you're always going to have people that will make an argument for everything to make it easier on themselves. Like you'll have a guy that goes into a nine to five is like, I don't have time to do fast cardio, but really like he probably does have time. He just doesn't need to go to sleep at 2 AM every fucking night. Right. Like there's just things that, you know, your lifestyle may change and you could have the time to do that. If you just had a better schedule and approach, which overall is going to make you a better, more productive human being realistically. The first thing we talked about was getting you on a specific, specific schedule every single day, eating your meals at the same time of day, getting up at the same time of day, doing everything at the same time of day, being regimented and, and being on a schedule is extremely important. And a lot of people don't do that. Now, when the guy you're referring to, the nine to five, it depends. Does he have a family? Does he have kids? Does he have other obligations? Um, if he's just working and lifting, then yeah, he can get up and do fast and cardio. It's not going to kill him, you know, especially get a piece for your house. You know, how hard is it to get a piece for your house in today's times? Well, even if you're off season months. doing fast cardio, even just like, you know, go like do like a light jog or speed walk around the outside, you know, get sunlight in the morning too. That's even better. You know, mm -hmm. Dorian Yates used to walk his dogs for contest prep for his morning cardio. Get a dog. That's all he did. <laughs> That's all he did is walk his dogs. You know, he yeah. didn't get on the step mill burning calories. But also, also, I want to add to that is that people. you know this as well is that the bigger the guy is, they can't. They usually can't do as much like intense cardio because they're at that risk for muscle loss. So a lot of guys, bigger guys, do less cardio and that lighter teach, cardio. Well, I teach that in my class that the bigger the competitor, the more you have to consider the type of cardio that they're doing. If you put a 250 pound bodybuilder on the step mill, he's going to burn a more, lot more calories and his body's going to endure a lot more stress from that activity than somebody who's 180. So you've always got to take into account how big the person is, what they weigh, how much muscle mass, their age. Um, the older someone is, the more, the, the, the more they're, the more they're going to, uh, they're going to incur 
you know, the, the effects of that, you know, it's going to affect their nervous system more. It's going to affect their energy levels more. As you get older, you just get less capable and that's all there is to it. After say 35, you know, you're going to start to really move downhill and you've got to consider that for all of these scenarios. But yeah, a bigger person, you've got to consider their cardio. My biggest guys, I try to keep them on the seated bike as much as possible to keep the stress off their legs. However, if there's somebody who has great genetic legs, I won't hesitate to throw them on the step mill and things like that in contest prep. But yes, you always have to consider um, how well that person is going to handle that stress of the cardio that you're assigning. Because if you start impacting training and performance, you start losing muscle. You start losing muscle, your metabolism slows down. Metabolism slows down. Now you've got to completely rework the entire equation, you know? Wow. So, you know, mitigating the, mitigating, mitigating the, the, the effects of that cardio is, is your primary concern. I think another thing that goes into that is doing cardio that's hard enough. So what I mean is getting your heart rate high enough. So for me, I can't walk my dog for cardio because that's just not hard enough to get my heart rate up to where now it's going to actually, for me, uh, affect my appetite and also improve my HDL. So that's the reason why, reasons why I do cardio and I can't get my heart rate up if I'm just walking my dog, even if I'm like fast walking. So I do it on an inclined treadmill because now it's a little bit more challenging, but it's not as challenging as like a Stairmaster to where that's, that's going to negatively affect my training if I'm doing enough of that. Um, so I, I that. it's going to, it's going to depend on uh, your, your body weight. It's going to depend on the yeah. duration and it's going to depend on where your diet is. For example, Dorian Yates was not lean off season. You know, he put on some body fat, but he was pe bone peeled for stage and he got bone peeled by walking his dogs. So if he can do it, why do other people need to be doing, need to be doing harder cardio? It's just a, it's a matter of, first of all, he was very heavy. He was probably started at 300 pounds walking his dogs every morning. And I believe he had big dogs, not little dogs. You have a little dog, you're walking for 10 minutes. If you have a big dog, you could walk your dog for an hour, you know? So if you could do that for hey, an wait, hour. Why is it? Why is and, that? I don't have dogs. Why do you say that? Well, the small dogs are going to get tired. Their legs are small. I walk my dog for hours every day. I take him to, I take him to school. I take him to the gym. I take so him like to... a little dog is like a baby. Like it'll just get tired of walking. <laughs> it's got smaller lungs. So it has a smaller lung capacity and also just gets more <laughs> tired, eats less food, has less energy. Uh, my dog's like a working dog. So he like always has energy. Yeah, no, I walk mine around the block. They get tired. So mine, gets more, mine gets more energy if I walk them. <laughs> so well, I mean, I walk enough, but the 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 point of it is, it, I don't think you have to get your heart rate to a certain point if all things are considered and everything is 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 you know balanced. But I like to typically set a heart rate range because I don't trust people to just do nothing. You know, if you tell people that, well, I think know, heart rate doesn't matter, they're going to walk at a two point out. Heart rate matters for like uh for heart health you no know, for improving hdl mainly absolutely but i i put i put high intensity interval training cardio after legs yeah on the spin bike because i feel like you you kill two birds with one stone you know you finish off the legs you know get a good pump uh elevate sensitivity and you know you get some good cardiovascular effects from it so i combine it with the workouts rather than doing it in the morning and i you know if you do first of all if you're training hard that right there is affecting your heart health. Your heart is thumping. Check your heart rate after a heavy set of squats. It's going to be through the roof. Yeah. You know, so our training is, is doing that too. You don't need a ton of cardio to have good heart health, but you should be doing it a couple of times a week, you know, pushing your heart rate. I don't mean like, no, I don't, not talking steady pace. I'm talking about pushing your heart rate a couple of times a week, but yes, more activity is always going to lead to more cardiovascular health within. I think, yeah. I think, uh, reason. Like you said, they, they hit the high intensity interval. I think that's just something really, I mean, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, like I, it's not something I ever really did, but logically it's something everybody should do just to be healthy and have longevity. Like you should do at least something once a week where like you're doing like maybe not necessarily sprints because sprints could like fuck with your knees, but something like that where you're really just challenging your cardiovascular endurance for like 15, 20 minutes. Well, again, you have a lot of young listeners, you have a lot of kids and you're never going to feel the effects of your cardiovascular health when you're 22 years old, 21 years old, you're, you're at the pinnacle of your, 
your your cardiovascular health. So you're not really going to feel. Well, much. I felt it in off seasons. Like once you get like once I've gotten like over two two hundred two hundred five pounds, like you feel like the sluggishness and just walking, you know, going upstairs. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I should not feel like this. <laughs> it's important to keep your heart strong when you're gaining weight because now your heart has a harder job to do. You yeah, know? and that's why there's always an acclimation period. The first time I hit two sixty. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't move. The last time I hit 265, I felt completely fine. You know, it's it's just a matter of adapting to that body weight and, and making sure your cardiovascular health is in check. But for the most part, once people get past 25, they'll notice a difference in their everyday life. I'm talking about dropping off the kids, going to work, regular activities. They're going to notice a difference in their in their energy levels based on where their cardiovascular health is. It's just kids below 25 don't tend to think about it because they don't feel the effects, but it's good to get in good habits now um, so that you have them for later in life. Cause it's hard to start to implement those changes when you haven't done, you haven't done them ever, you know? Yeah. And then you start to get kind of like, Oh shit. I know you'll hear this from old people all the time. Shit, I never had to do this when I was young. You know, like I never had to do mobility work until I was over 30, you know, but as you age, shit happens and you're going to have to do things. So it's good to get in those habits early. Yeah, especially when you're young, you have more neuroplasticity. And so building habits when you're young is incredibly important. That's why I'm big on, you know, having my habits in place and having a schedule for everything and having living life I want to live right now and not waiting till the future when I'm 30, when I actually have to do, you know, cardio for my health. Because right now it's putting those uh, those neural pathways in my brain, getting those uh, deeper, uh, strengthening those neural pathways. So that way, once I'm 25, 30, I'm not going to have to try to increase those uh, that neuroplasticity because it's going to be much harder to do it then. So for it's funny that you went in that direction because I actually um, talk about this with people. Um, Neuro for the, for the listeners, neuroplasticity is your 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 brain's ability to rewire and connect synapses and retrain itself for new activities. And this is why they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The reason they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks is an older dog doesn't have the neuroplasticity. So it can't record and maintain those habits the way you could when you were young. You're going to learn better when you're young. So yes, if you implement the right habits young, it's going to translate to when you're older. When you try to learn new things, you know, past 30, 35 years old, it's doable, of course, absolutely. But it's nowhere near as easy as when you were younger. You think that's why so a getting, lot of people like have a hard time getting into, you know, a regiment into fitness as they, you know, get older. Cause I think now, now you mentioned that, like it, it, since I started at such a young age, you know, I started basically like bodybuilding at 13, you know, prepping my meals, bringing them to school, training every day. And people would always ask me like, how do you stay dedicated all the time? And it's like, it's literally just like wired in me as something that I do. It's not even like, if I don't do that, it's like, I'm not even myself at that point. It's like literally like brushing your teeth or something. People get so stuck in that's their ways. Why, yeah. That's why it's important to get in these good habits before you get older. Absolutely. Neuroplasticity was a phenomenal point to make on this. Yeah. That's okay. So to reiterate on the whole insulin sensitivity thing, we want to be insulin sensitive. How we can maintain that is by not overeating, you know, carb cycling, having a better diet approach. And with that, obviously, comes first and foremost, like me and Adam talked in the last podcast, if you guys didn't listen to that, is having a structured meal plan in place. Because if you don't have a meal plan, you just do, if it fits your macros and try to fit things in, you don't have actual, like, you know, nutrient timing in place. And there's all these other variables that you can't account for. There's going to be a lot of problems that you can't fix you won't know how to fix them you won't know how to go about them so you need to be on some type of structure plan it doesn't have to be eat this exact thing every day but you know you could there could be some flexibility in that but have you know a plan to follow that way you can make adjustments accordingly and um we still never touch on how exactly do you find that amount right how do you like somebody say i'll just start getting to the gym i want to bulk i want to put on size you know am i too focused on the scale how do i know this is a good amount for me to eat even though i may not be getting a pound every single week you know is this too much how do i you know know what that sweet spot is are you progressing in the gym and are you putting on body fat if you're progressing in the gym Absolutely. that's what you wanted to be doing is progressing in the gym but if you're putting on body fat too quickly, then you're eating too much. I think it's that simple. I also, I also look for water retention simply because water retention is a sign of insulin resistance and too many carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, that's you know going to be an acute response, something that we see very, very quickly um, in the beginning of a, um, 
of a period where we're eating a little too much. So I think that the best way is to, you know, implement something conservatively and you could always move up. I've had people where I put them on a diet and they gain 10 pounds in the first week. That tells me I already, that already tells me I gave them too many, too much food, you know, whereas other people won't move for a couple of weeks. And that tells me I gave them too little. Um, but I do have an acclimation period too in the programs that I do with new clients, you know, that, so the first four weeks is basically acclimating and priming, you know, I mean, yes, they're going to make improvements, but it's acclimating and priming too, for what we actually want to do. That's what I'm trying to get at, because it's like, it's not a simple answer. Because first of all, one person, I mean, as coaches, we could visually see, you know, some person might gain six pounds in a month and it's perfectly fine. They're moving at a good pace. Some other person might gain that six pounds and we're like, that's too much, right? You know, that's too much for that person. But then also we had the whole aspect of, can they handle this and digest it properly? Do we need to acclimate them to the certain amount of food first? You know, so at that whole first four or eight week period, we might not even be really looking to move on the scale, but just get them to be able to eat a substantial amount of food within whatever their maintenance might be, right? So it's not always as simple as gain one pound a week, look for this or gain at least this amount. It's just, it's such a hard thing to really give a generalized answer to. Well, the first four weeks in any program for me is about um, optimizing digestion, uh, making sure they're processing everything properly, and then getting a baseline for them. So it's the first four weeks is going to tell me, you know, what those calories did, how they're digesting, how they're feeling, everything like that. And it's going to be a nice solid baseline. Like you, to your point before about having a set meal plan and having a schedule, um, this is why there's controls in experiments because it helps you isolate certain things and pick out variables and and identify what exactly is going on. If there's too many moving parts, you don't know which moving part is responsible for the problem. If there's only two moving parts, then you've only got to look at those two things and figure out which one is responsible for the problem. So the less moving parts, the better. So yeah, the more constants we have in our daily activities, if something goes wrong, we can pinpoint it. This is why I've explained, we've gone over peaking a little bit. We're going to go over it more, but you'll see that I isolate each step one by one by one. A lot of coaches, uh, a lot of the Olympia level coaches use what's called, use what I consider the kitchen sink method. You know, they throw everything at you. They're carb loading, they're water loading, they're cutting water, they're playing with sodium, they're throwing diuretics in, they're using it. So they're going up and, oh, he's holding water, give him a diuretic. Oh shit, now he's flat, let's give him some fucking carbs. He's not full enough, let's hit him with some insulin. Oh shit, he's holding water again, let's give him another diuretic. And they're just going like this until they land on the line. Whereas if you isolate each individual thing, you know, if anything goes wrong, if anything's off, you know exactly what the culprit is. If I start carb loading, water loading, play with sodium and using insulin and using diuretics, mm -hmm. and I don't look the way I want to look, well, which one is the culprit? Who yeah. the hell knows? Yeah. You know, but if you isolate the process, it's much easier to, turn, to determine what to look at. And this is, this goes to decision making, you know, a great coach is a great decision maker, but a great decision maker is going to rely on again, those constants and being able to minimize the things that they have to look at to make more accurate decisions. Yeah. This is also why if you guys listening, if you have a coach and you're lying to them, they're never going to be able to help you. You're not even lying. If no, you're just I, with, I, I, we're just withholding information. They're not going to be able to accurately help you. I've, I've had this conversation with people in prep um, a couple of times where I've just straight out said to them, you know, like, this looks like you're cheating. And I'm like, if you, if you are cheating, you need to tell me because if you if, if you tell me, I'm going to be upset, but I can fix it. And then you're going to look okay. If you lie to me, you're going to embarrass yourself on stage, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So you choose, you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to help yourself. Man up, take the hit, admit what you did, and we can fix it. If I if otherwise I'm going to be I'm going to be thinking that, okay, this is not because of the, I'm going to start changing things that are working and I'm going to alter the plan and then it's not going to work. So I need to know exactly what I'm looking at. So yes, that's why it's important to be honest with your coach because whatever, what they don't know, they can't consider in their decisions. Yeah. So another thing would be, you know, to maintain sensitivity. I know we talked about this is not snacking in between meals to have those, those time periods where you have the, the drop in blood glucose. Um, so there's that. Obviously, you know, if you're obviously listening to this, you probably already trained. So you're probably already have good energy expenditure. If you're somebody who's very sedentary, that's how, something you would probably want to do is, you know, start exercising, start moving around. Um, so having that set meal plan, you know, having the carbs lower on the off days. Would you say this is something that 
because a, a lot of the kid people ask me it's their kids, right? They're like 18 years old. And I feel like a lot of those kids, you know, especially the ones with like the fast metabolisms, is this isn't something they're really gonna deal with at that point, you know, when you're newer and they're, you know, they're eating pizza, burning through everything, you know, is this something that at that point is really going to occur to them, the instant resistance? You got to understand that uh, people reach awareness at different speeds in life. Yeah. Um, and they mature at different rates. Uh, like I've told you numerous times, you're very aware for your age of what's going on in the world around you. Whereas a lot of young kids are not. So they don't pay attention to a lot of things. You know, I, I, I've i told you a bunch of times, there's many times when I saw something on my physique in prep and I'm like, oh shit, did I get injured? Did this happen? Did that happen? I go look at old pictures. It was always there. I never saw it. It's just, I didn't notice it. So a lot of times, like we talked about the digestive uh, issues that we were going over, we were discussing. They don't, yeah, they don't notice that they're actually like that. having a problem with it. They don't notice. They're like, oh, I have a stomach ache. That's normal. It'll go away. Like, all oh, this yeah. is random. How many, a million times I've said that to myself before I realized I had colitis. Oh, this is just, I ate something bad. I, you know, but, uh, it's just, you never realize. Well, what I'm getting at is. I'm getting at is like, you know, say, you know, when I was 17, I was super serious about bodybuilding, you know, it was still at my, like, I really dropped out of school was my whole life. But at that time, like, I didn't know any of this shit at that point, you know, looking back at 17 year old me, would you have said like, Hey, we should run A1C test. We should be checking your blood glucose for that person at that, at that time frame. It depends on your comp. It depends on your composition. You know, I'm never going to go check for something. If everything is going good, I'm going to check if things are going bad. I have a very short, well, somebody who, somebody who doesn't have a coach though. Well, again, my, my policy is don't fix what's not broken. If you're lean, if you're making improvements consistent, consistently, your pumps are great, strength's going up, you're putting on muscle mass, who cares if you're wrong or right? It's working. Keep going. You know, I don't change things and analyze things unless things are not going correctly. Because, yes, like I said, I've had people who put on a bunch of muscle and we ran an A1C and it was 5.38. I said, fuck it, keep going. You know, it, it, it's a matter of don't fix what's not broken. I don't analyze things and start to make changes unless something's wrong. I've had guys on the same bulking diet for nine months and continue to make make gains. You know, I might have adjusted it like minorly once. You know, mm -hmm. I, I make a lot of manual changes through text. You know that. So yeah. I'll say three days off skip your cheat meals this week, things like that. But for the most part, the hard copy, the piece of paper that you get in an email, that stays for a long period of time if it's accurate. And I've seen there's pros that use the same bulking diet for years, years, yeah, because yeah. it fucking works when, when, when they're, when they're, when they have the right starting point and they execute it properly and they understand, you know, that they've got to take rest days and they've got to back off things here and there and they understand all these things and it just works. You know, so if something's working, don't fuck with it. If it's not working, decide why it's not working. But it's important to learn all these lessons anyway, so that you can consider these things in the future. Yeah. Would you ever, I mean, I guess we're, we're kind of doing it right now. Start like a, you know, you have a, web, you're starting a website and app too, like an educational kind of platform, similar to like J3U is kind of something that you are trying to create, right? Um, I'm not doing it like um, like a university style. Um, it's just basically informational on on different topics. Um, you know, I, I just like to, you know, be as concise and to the point and isolate like the thing. How many things have we talked about here on this podcast? Yeah. And people have to weed through them, you know, to get each different topic, whereas you probably could break down each of the things that we've talked to into like five minutes. And that, if and that was that was the goal going into this. Let's just cover insulin resistance, but that obviously didn't happen. Well, it's tough to do because all these things relate. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's nice that if you just have one problem, if you can go look look at two or three videos, and there's your solution, rather than having to listen to a two hour, three hour podcast to get your answers, and you know they're still not you know completely answered. Yeah, you, know, you could be a lot more organized and, and concise. Um, you know, I don't write anything for these. I don't even care to know the topic before we do the podcast. Everything comes out of here, <laughs> you know, but if I had sat down and went through the, the questions step by step, I could definitely make it a lot more concise, be a lot less redundant, which I'm known to do and, uh, you know, get to the point. Yeah. So that's, that's the whole thing about that saving time, you know, getting to the point, getting the information you need void of the clutter and moving forward. What do you think you'll have that that up by? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, 
as you know, I lost my social media. So uh, Instagram banned me for one reason or another. I still so think I you could, I still think you could get that account back. I'm trying, but I don't think so. But, if anybody watching um, this knows how to get an account back, DM me or Phil. <laughs> yeah, I would appreciate it. But, you know, with, with 2,000 people on Instagram right now, it's not a very big audience to market something like that to. So I'll probably drop the website and delay the app, app release until I can at least build my platforms back. Yeah, yeah. But then you're doing uh, the prep class again this this uh upcoming week right week right um this uh this upcoming weekend i'm going to be teaching my prep class again yes i haven't taught it live in uh, almost a year uh it was very popular i had a lot of coaches come back to me that took the class that said you know what like they it, it was actually really cool to watch because i didn't i didn't expect this when i did the classes that i was going to have people immediately after the classes that season sending me pictures oh my guy won i did exactly what you said like you've changed my coaching. Uh, one guy, uh, I think he was in Europe, actually said that uh, I completely changed his coaching business, and you know now he's got more than enough money and he's mm-hmm. doing phenomenal. It's, it's great to see that you could actually change someone's life with education. You know, like yeah. literally a one eighty. But it, it was very good to see that people were not just taking the class, but they were applying it and they were able to apply it, and and they learned a lot. And you know. I don't like misinformation, bad information. You know that. We talked about this a million times, how nine times out of 10 things people read online are wrong and it's crap. But I'd like to be a part of directing people in the right direction. Yeah. So you just said you're doing that next weekend, what, that 16th or 17th? What is it? Uh, 15th and 16th, Saturday and Sunday. And how do people sign up for that? They just DM you? Are you still taking on people for it? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I still have some spots open for it because um, I left 30 seats open. I think I sold about 20. So I should I do have about 10 spots left. Um, those will probably be on this week, hopefully. And, uh, you know, we'll have a pretty solid class. But, yeah, if anybody wants to sign up for that, shoot me a DM. And uh, there's actually a flyer for it on my uh, Instagram, phil.viz. And you could read all about it, see what it entails, decide if you want to take it. But I think if you're a competitor that's serious, or if you're looking, if you're somebody who's looking to get into coaching, um, this is one of the first things you're going to want to do and learn. Yeah, I've taken it. It's it's really good. Um, it's long though. You broke it up into two sessions now, right? Yeah, you were in my first class, right? When it was seven and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a fifty two page PowerPoint presentation. It's very 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 long. Um, you know, I talk very very fast. And I know the material very well, and it's still hard for me to get done in under eight hours. So the first day was like seven and a half hours or something like that, and everybody sat through it. And I realized I had to break it down into two days of three and a half hours, plus a question and answer at the end of each. So it's it's a little time consuming, but it's, it's packed with material. You get the recording afterwards, so you can go back and watch it again. Um, if you have any questions that you missed during the class, feel free to DM me. You know, I do that all the time, no problem. Yeah, but I answer a lot of the questions in the Q and A after each sec after each session, and usually we cover a lot of information, and people don't end up having too many questions because of the style in which um, I teach. You know, I'm pretty good at teaching and making things simple for people and, yeah. and and able to understand, so you can use the information. Yeah, well, you guys go check that out if you want. You can follow Phil's new account until we get his old one back, which I feel like is possible. Did we did we miss anything, Adam? Did we talk about everything? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's obviously you know, like small little nuances within the whole topic. Like, uh, not everybody should be eating cheat meals. I think Phil has a great strategy with implementing cheat meals, but I don't think a lot of people are going to be eating cheat meals on a zero carb day. They're going to be eating cheat meals on the regular diet, and that's what's going to negatively affect insulin sensitivity because you can't absorb all of it, especially if you're gaining fat. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think we definitely covered a lot of it. Okay. Well, if you guys have any questions, obviously leave a comment. You could uh, ask any of us questions on our Q&As. We all do Q&As on Instagram and whatnot. And if there's any other topics that you want us to specifically cover, you know, everybody was asking about instant sensitivity, just comment that as well. And I will try to get Phil back on. I'm going to convince Phil to get back on and we can go over some more stuff here. But yeah, make sure you guys like this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And thanks for tuning in to another episode of Brass Tech Bodybuilding. I will see you guys later.